Well, welcome everyone. Uh, as you can see, a couple of us are uh, wearing our special hats to celebrate 50 years of um, our 50 year anniversary. Um, so very, very pleased to have a panel of past presidents with us today. Um, WATESOL is an organization of volunteer leaders. Every leader brings their passion to the work and propels the organization forward in a way that's unique to them and to their team. And every board, every team is grateful for the work of the leaders who served before them. Um, I wanna point out that uh, the extraordinary work of this year's board um, to make this conference come to life the way that it has today. Um, this is a conference unlike any other in Watisol's history, for sure. Um, so while this may not have been what they imagined the conference would look like, uh, I think this is an extraordinarily special way to celebrate our 50th. And there are so many things that we're gonna learn from this that will carry us forward uh, into our next 50 years. So please give a shout out when you have an opportunity to the board members, um, this year's board, this year's board members. Um, so order of operations for today, um, we're going to start out with, uh, I have some historical tidbits to share to, as a backdrop as we celebrate our 50th. Um, we'll do introductions with our esteemed panelists. Um, so each Watiso president will introduce and um, they'll have a, a moment to share what was happening in the organization during their time as president and in the field as well. Um, and then we'll have a broader discussion together about uh, what inspired our panelists to take the leadership role, what challenges they faced, um, proud moments, fond memories, and lessons learned. Uh, we'll wrap up with advice for uh, future leaders and a look into the future. And we'll also open it up for questions uh, from the audience. So here are some historical tidbits. Yeah. If you've done the math, uh, we were founded in 1970. Back in 1970, the dues for the year were $2.50. <laughs> the first two-day workshop, uh, which later grew into what we now know as our fall conference, was held in 1975 at Georgetown. And the first fall convention was held at UMBC in September of 1980. At the very beginning, they, be they began publishing newsletters in 1970, all the way through to what we know as our newsletter today. Um, at um, certain points in our history also, there were working papers and a journal. We were one of the first, but not the first, affiliate of um, TESOL International. Preceding us in 1969 were Texas, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico. In 1970, we became an affiliate alongside Illinois, California, and New York. And at that time, um, we provided, um, uh, our, our Watisol served a much broader geographical region, including Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. The committee that we now call the Advocacy Committee started out at the very beginning, known as the Legislative Awareness Committee, and that was established in 1972. It evolved to become the Sociopolitical Committee, and now we, we know it as our Advocacy Committee. Um, two of our WATESOL presidents who are joining us today, we're very honored, also served as TESOL International presidents, Brock Brady and Jody Crandall. And many of WATESOL's board members also served on the TESOL International Board. So that gives a little bit <clears throat> of, uh, of history for us to start with. Um, so, 
what we're going to start with is some introductions, and I thought it would be helpful to do it in chronological order. So, Jody, that brings you up first. Okay. Um, Jody, Jody Crandall uh, served as Wachisel president from 1981 to 1983. Um, Jody is Professor Emerita of Education at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where she co-directed the MA TESOL program and established and directed the PhD program in language, literacy, and culture. She's a former president of WATESOL, International TESOL, and American Association for Applied Linguistics. So Jody, can you tell us a little bit about your time um, as president of WATISO, what was happening in the organization in the field? Okay. Yeah, um, I should let you know that I was the last pre uh, president of WATISO to serve two terms. <laughs> I think they must have learned from the mistakes because from that point on, it became a, a one-year uh, term. Um, there was, I think, the, the best thing to talk about is what were the things that were what what were the ideas. Um, that were circulating in the field. And it was a really ex exciting time because in the 80s is when notional functional syllabus came out, when the um, emphasis in, in TESOL shifted increasingly to thinking about teaching language communicatively. Um, it was a heavy focus on academic English and all about the, what the difference between academic and social English and English for academic purposes at the university level. Also nicely um, a focus on vocational ESL and content-based English. So we were getting a whole lot more focused on what I, what I perceive, <laughs> this is my bias, to be much more relevant instruction. These are, these are things that people could actually understand why they were learning a language for. Um, and also that uh, the, the emphasis in writing had changed. It was no longer focused so much on writing as a product, but rather writing as a process. Um, so it was an exciting time. Um, for for Watisa, I think it was, we were still very much, um, what's the word I want, um, enriched by our relationship with Tiso. And um, I think I'll leave it at that and then come back to that. Awesome, thanks Jody. That brings us to Brock Brady, who served as Watisil president from 2001 to 2002. Brock is a Peace Corps education expert. Prior to Peace Corps, he was the co-director of AU's TESOL program. He has been Watisil president and president of TESOL International. So Brock, tell us about what was happening during your time. Well, <clears throat> I think it's no coincidence that uh, Karen kind of popped up on the stage and became a lot more uh, Im immediate than anyone had been, because that was really the time when I think pronunciation really took off. Uh, Judy Gilbert in particular kind of led the charge, but people became very, very interested in dealing with pronunciation in ways that they hadn't. It was also a time that there was a lot more emphasis on sociocultural uh, aspects of learning languages that had then had been around for a while. Um, yeah. Awesome. And so directly following Brock was Karen Taylor. Karen served as Watchesel president from 2002 to 2003. Karen attended her first Watchesel convention in 1999 and dove right in from there serving as convention chair from 2000 to 2003, and on the board from 2001 to 2004. She juggled jobs at the Maryland English Institute, American University, and Brief for <laughs> nine years before heading to Mexico as a Fulbright TEFL specialist. And in 2011, she and co-author Shirley Thompson founded the Teacher Built Company, English Language Teaching Training Solutions, excuse me, Home of the color vowel chart. <laughs> so Karen, tell us about your time. Well, you know, I'm going to say, I wish I had the kind of global perspective that, that Jody was able to share, but I think I was kind of a baby. Like I was just pretty much at the beginning of my real career and I had just returned from being abroad before. And uh, so it was very much a way to connect and to 
learn what it is to have it to be an organization. So for me, it was a very personal memory that I, it is a very personal memory that I have. And yes, there was a lot happening with pronunciation in those days for sure. Um, but it was a time that I was just keenly aware of what it takes to run an organization. And, and not that I was running it, but that it was, it had been run for all these years. And here we were uh, responsible for keeping it alive. And th that was, I don't know, those meetings were all at AU. Uh, I think they were Tuesday nights. I remember a lot of those meetings and just realizing people like Joe Bellino and just all the little pieces that go to the people that make an organization float uh, or, or in the case, you know, when we've seen stumbles along the way, you know, you realize people have complex lives. And so I, that was what it was for me was just marveling at all of the people involved in making this organization what it was. Awesome. So following Karen, we've got Carolyn Bushy. Carolyn was uh, Wachisa president from 2008 to 2009. Um, Carolyn has taught for 20 plus years in both ESL and EFL contexts. She received her MIT cell from American University and just retired from UMD after 10 years teaching English for academic purposes. Congratulations, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. She's now working at Montgomery College as a teacher trainer in the TESOL certificate program. So Carolyn, tell us, tell us about your time. Thanks, Heather. Well, I had the great good fortune of doing my MA TESOL at American University under uh, Brock Brady's guidance, so shout out to Brock. And as a result, because Brock was so involved with WATESOL and TESOL, we students were were being modeled um, in real time, you know, of being part of this uh, um, larger community. And not only were we having, you know, the idea of being actively involved in, in leadership, both membership and leadership, um, but we were encouraged to. And so I really do thank Brock for, you know, being kind of the, the guiding force uh, behind me becoming involved in WATISOL. The second thing that really influenced my decision to get involved was yes. when I served overseas as an English language fellow in Moscow. And um, <clears throat> but my, my, my time was not spent exclusively in Moscow, but all over the country. And that meant working with um, numerous, as you can imagine in Russia, numerous um, TESOL affiliates. And I was so inspired by the, the people I was working with and their commitment to the field and to improving it for themselves and their mentor, their mentees and their members of their community that I said, you know, when I go back to the United States, this, this, is, the, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to be. And I hope I can take what I saw in those good practices in terms of um, organizational management and, and, and share it. And so I was very fortunate to have that opportunity. Following Carolyn was Melissa Servos. And Melissa, I think you did serve two, two terms, right? Oh. Um, yeah, I think two, one and a half, two, something like that. <laughs> well, that <was> <laughs> a little extra. <laughs> there, was, there was a period of time where we went back to those two terms. That yeah, two terms yeah. It didn't last long. <laughs> Well, Melissa, yeah. <laughs> it was fun while it lasted, I have to say. <laughs> Melissa served as Wachiso president from 2010 to 2012. Um, let's see here. Melissa is an experienced adult education professional, leading local, state, and national professional development and technical assistance projects. She has a background in teacher training, program design, and materials development. Thanks. Um, I, I first have to say thank you to Carolyn for bringing me back into Watisa. So when I was in graduate school at AU, it was the end, um, end of the 90s, and I was engaged. Um, I had found many of my jobs via Watisa, um, but had sort of drifted away. And then Carolyn and I in weird ways have been circling each other our entire careers. So um, we've got, we had the opportunity to meet, to work together. And then she um, 
got me back engaged with Watisa, which I was grateful for um, because the organization had given me so much um, and it gives the people that I work with so much. It's always the, the, the first thing I talk to when I talk to new teachers about where to go to look for support in this area. Um, we are amazingly lucky to have a strong organization. I learned that through the years of um, visiting other programs, going to national events, international events, talking to other affiliates. Um, we have a very rich and strong history and organization and um, the opportunity to be a part of that and get volunteer my time back was really, um, really important to me. I also second Karen on the learning what it's like to be a part of an organization that has to do things like this. Um, it's a lot, um, it's not, it's, it's a lot of work and um, often underappreciated um, when you're on the outside and you really learn when you're on the inside um, what people are doing to get this ship um, sailing. Um, so I, I came in, um, I served two terms-ish, um, and then <laughs> I moved back, I moved out, um, and I'm glad that I'm back in again. I seem to be taking breaks from what you saw here and there, because my current work does not really involve a whole ton of language learning at this moment, <laughs> um, and language instruction. So I'm glad to re-engage with the community that, I, that supported me along the way, so I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Awesome. And, and let's see, now we're almost to current day. We've got Betsy Lindemann Wong. Betsy was YTSA president from 2018 to 2019. And um, Betsy is a technical writer for risk mitigation consulting and a former ESL program coordinator. Betsy co-authored Project Success One and Future Five teacher's edition for Pearson Longman, and has created digital ESL materials for Burlington English. So Betsy, tell us about your time. Thanks, Heather. Well, when I came in in November of 2018, the current administration had been in office for exactly one year. And at the local and national levels, as you can well imagine, we were seeing this ripple effect from a lot of resentment and hostility toward immigrant community. We were seeing restrictions placed on refugees in terms of limiting their numbers and making it harder for certain classes to enter. We were seeing punitive measures being taken against undocumented um, immigrants from other countries. And we were seeing kind of a general hostility toward immigrants based on a very inflamed rhetoric and we were also seeing sort of a general intolerance of anybody who differed from the type of norm. So when I came into Watisal, I think we shifted sort of the focus from um, a lot of what we were doing that had related more to pedagogy into more affective factors that affect student learning. And I want to give a shout out to Paulina Vinogradova, who is here with us today. Thanks to her amazing hard work and advocacy, we were able to sponsor programs and bring in distinguished guest speakers who address things like helping to support undocumented students, helping to make our LGBTQ learners feel comfortable and supported in the classroom. And this really dovetailed with what was going on with TESOL as a whole. And I feel like we really sort of ramped up the advocacy efforts um, and that is continuing today. Thanks, Betsy. Mm -hmm. I think that's a nice um, segue into thinking more deeply or unpacking a little bit more maybe about what challenges were you facing? And this is to any of the panelists who would like to engage. Um, what were some of the challenges that you faced during your time on the board? And this could be in the field or within the organization. I think I could do that. <laughs> there was, um, I was president during the time in which we um, moved to a new executive director. And it was, the, the, it was unfortunate. The choice that we made was not somebody that was what we would have wanted. Um, and I ended up spending an awful lot of my time 
um, trying to, to help with that. I should say though that we were very fortunate later to have Susan Bailey come on um, and she's, she has been wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, that, that can definitely have uh, an effect when the parent organization is also struggling. Yep. Does anybody else want to address some of the challenges that were in your sphere? Well, I just recall that, you know, Brock was president when I was vice president. I was doing a lot with exhibitors, but that was when 9-11 happened. And there was just a great deal of movement in, you know, happening uh, with visas dropping off and then a lot of uncertainty and then and then the moves that happened in 2002 and three uh, myself included you know I left I left Maryland English Institute 2003 mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us did and so there was just a, a lot of that uncertainty about you know who what kind of professional options there were and a lot of adjuncting so I, I remember that being the question is sort of, is this a living? <laughs> and that, that, that's come up again and again over the years is, is this, is this actually a, when it comes to degrees in TESOL, is it something we can recommend as a living? And so that, <laughs> I remember that coming up. <laughs> yeah. And one of the consequences of that situation um, was that prior to that, when we were still having good enrollments in English language uh, programs, it was very easy for to get universities and colleges to provide spaces for our events for nothing. Yes. And then all of a sudden we had to start paying. And for a while we were paying and it was a reduced rate and it wasn't too bad. But then eventually after a couple of years, you had to pay the same rate that anybody else was paying. And it really had a, a, a difficult effect on our financial situations. In fact, I think I vividly remember, I think the last time we were able to be in a hotel conference center was Nova and we were in the conference center there. And it was kind of a wonderful, I don't know, I remember that conference. And then after that, it was all just the, the smallest borrowed corner and whatever we could find. And I know that our successors had a hard time finding space for sure. Yeah. That was always a challenge. That continues to be a challenge. <laughs> Yeah. Was it also a challenge to have to make sure that we had the conferences sort of spread out? Because at that time, at least when I was president, we had, we were uh, Virginia, um, um, Maryland, um, and, and the district. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our members actually lived in Virginia and Maryland. They, they weren't living in the mm -hmm. district. And it was, it, it, that was a challenge. And I think it also later on must have been a challenge for those of you who are president or on the board when Maryland TESOL formed and then became quite, quite prominent. I mean, they, they, got, they got large pretty fast. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's because if you were living in Baltimore, you didn't want to come all the way into DC. I mean, it's so it, it, I think there were just a lot of places where there were changes taking place. I don't remember what day I was at UMBC when Maryland TESOL started. So it was after 92, but I'm not sure ex exactly the year of that. Yeah, I can remember two years. They were maybe like three or four years apart where uh, uh, Maryland TESOL and Wa TESOL double booked on the same weekend. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. oh <geez. laughs> yeah. So what about uh, thinking back to your time on the board, what were some of your proudest moments or fondest memories, <laughs> things that you're proud of? I can, I can chime in there. Um, one of the things I first noticed when I came on was that there had been a significant decline in enrollment of members. And I think it must have been at its peak um, under Brock's uh, guidance. And for any number of reasons, I think a lot of which we've touched on here, you know, a couple of years down the road, we're, we're not seeing as many members. And of course, you know, there's a bottom line issue to that. So I, I thought long and hard about, you know, how do we, it, not just I increase our, our um, enrollment of members, but also broaden our enrollment. Because I, working as a teacher trainer at this point under a program, shout out to Melissa, who actually stood up the program at Montgomery College, we're working primarily with volunteer teachers. And it, you know, it quickly became clear to me that not only did these volunteer teachers not even know what 
what he saw was, but also they, if they did, they had a sense that they weren't welcome. You know, it was only for real teachers. Mm -hmm. And so I really made a very, very concerted effort to, to reach out, you know, above and beyond just people in, you know, sort of the traditional academic settings um, or K through 12 and, and really try to get the word out um, that, you know, there is a place for people, even, even if you aren't a full-time teacher, even if you are not a paid teacher. Um, and just to, to, to really do a full court press on, on making Watisal more visible to a wider swath of the community. Well, and speaking of widening the community, one thing that just was such a happy moment for me um, and unexpected um, was corresponding with a, um, a Watisal member who had been in the DC area, although he was originally from the Philippines, who then moved to Thailand um, to begin teaching English at a K through 12 school, um, specifically the elementary part of it. And he and several of his colleagues were really um, interested in professional development and there just wasn't a whole lot available in Thailand. So two of his colleagues were actually able to get visas and come to last year's Watisal conference. And I met them there and I hung out with them for a couple of sessions. And I mean, it was just so cool, you know, being with people who came from another part of the world just because they had heard this one member, and they became members, um, who had spoken so highly of Watisal and how valuable our past conferences had been to him that he encouraged other members to attend. Um, and I really enjoyed speaking with them. Um, and they did content instruction. One taught ESL for students um, going into nursing, the other for computers. And it was just really, really interesting and rewarding. I think mean, one highlight was just working and, and again, because we had such a tight team at the time, but we got to do Baltimore TESOL, big TESOL. And so just being the affiliate that supported that along with Maryland TESOL, I'm sure. I think we divvied it up and each I think there was a lot of discussion about exactly that, like how to share that responsibility. But uh, just being so close by and being so hands-on in, in that convention was a lot of fun for our team and um, just a great morale booster and a membership builder, by the way, too. So that was neat. That's a whole other layer of work in addition to a normal, typical year. <laughs> how did that feel? Did that feel really heavy? Or it sounds like you had a lot of excitement around it, but... Well, I didn't have kids at the time, so, <laughs> so that was great. I mean, I don't know, it was very much a time when we just lived Watisal. Everything was, it was all Watisal all the time, I think. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And that was either the last or the next to the last time that it was done in the way that it was before, where it was like 50-50, where the affiliates did part of it and the main office did the other part of it. I remember being really furious because I discovered that I was required to go to St. Louis uh, to, to be trained to be able to do this. And nobody had told me about it until a month before I was supposed to leave. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, Brock was fearless. He, he definitely led us through that wild phase. <laughs> a lot of teams and I don't know, it was, it was pretty, I think there were like 10 different teams that we ran can't quite recall them all, but a lot of fun. Any other proud moments or things that um, that make you smile when you think back? Just, I would also say the conferences, you know, that to me is always the, it's, it's the main event that we're seen doing and, and they are, they're very gratifying to run and uh, sometimes humorous to run <laughs> you, know, you just get different, different things strange. each year out of them <laughs> and you write you know you work so hard and then you get the uh the evaluations at the end of the the whole conference and you read through them with your exhausted team and mm -hmm. I, I remember a couple funny things coming out of those so yeah a lot of fun with that 
And I also think... the conferences at, at the affiliate level are so much more intimate than, mm -hmm. than what happens at, at the, you know, at TESOL International level. Mm -hmm. um, although it, in the old days, the uh, international TESOL conferences were totally run by volunteers. There was, there, there was only an executive director and his assistant in the central office, and they didn't hire the convention uh, bureaus. And <laughs> so it was, it was a very intimate time <laughs> when you had to do everything that at least some of the things now are at least being done by, by um, convention staff, in, 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 at least in international TESOL probably not at all yet on Wati, so right? Are there any, is there any convention support that's outside of the volunteers and the, and the members? Nope. Nope. <laughs> now, well, it's a lot harder then. <laughs> yeah. There wasn't when, when I was president either. We had our first conference and we did it all. <laughs> yeah. It was actually held at UMBC, but I didn't hardly knew UMBC at the time. <laughs> you know, one thing I'll mention is, is the, the sister relationship with Ates and Gail Doherty in particular was responsible for that. Ates was the Senegalese Teachers Association. And for what, I guess about five years, we managed to keep it going. Um, but- Can you talk a little bit more about that, Brock, for those who might not be familiar? Um, yeah. Uh, I think it was Jenny, Jen, Jenny Leshniff also yes. play a role in that. Yeah, yeah she's the one who set it up, yeah. yeah. And in 2005, uh, TESOL had one of its first overseas um, convention sorts of event, conference sorts of events, and it was being held in Senegal. And uh, Chuck at that, I was seeing him at that time was very much made lots of good friends and wanted to continue relationships with them. Um, and we got to talking and we thought, wouldn't it be great to have a sister association that we could correspond with and exchange and share things and uh, we put it together. And it was always difficult because we were covering our costs if we sent somebody from the uh, Watisol to Senegal. But if somebody from Senegal was come to, going to come to the United States, we had to pick that up too. And so it was a great relationship. And, and uh, in fact, one of the people that's been nominated to run for the uh, board of directors for TESOL this year was one of the people that was most influential in Atis at that time, Mal Assad. And uh, so, yeah, it was quite exciting while it, while it went on, but it turned out in the end, it was just a matter of Wa TESOL paying every year. And it wasn't like we were getting more funds in, we were getting less. What were some of the benefits from that, that, that you saw amongst the members and the community? Um, people learned a lot more about what the teaching situation was like in Senegal, that's for sure. Um, and of course, the Senegalese teachers got the opportunity to go to the United States and participate, which is something that they would have never had at all. And they were very, very warmly received. Uh, they were also typically, um, uh, TESOL International would bring them in for the, or somebody in the real office would also bring them in for the convention. So. Sometimes they came twice. They came once for the Watiso conference, and then they came also for uh, Tiso International. Yeah, that was something that uh, happened well before my time. But as I look back in the archives, I've always thought how interesting that must have been and how exciting. Um, okay, let's let's pivot a little bit here and talk about what. Um, what you learn, uh, you can, we can take two, two roads with this. What did you learn about yourself as a leader through being the president or serving on the board of Watiso? And or what did you learn about the Watiso organization during that time? I'll, I'll start. I, I think I learned a tremendous amount of how wonderful and how talented the membership was and, and, and still is. Um, when, because um, I was close by and because of the relationship between TESOL and Watt TESOL, they're, they're only five years apart in, in, in uh, 
when TESOL celebrated its 40th anniversary, when WATESOL celebrated its 35th, um, we had a really close relationship. And I think that still exists. Um, I think there still is support from the central office or in, a much larger um, TESOL organization than there, than there used to be. But um, I think internally, we just had such incredibly uh, talented um, uh, leaders as well as leaders, not just in terms of leadership of, of organizations, but also um, incredibly um, well published um, scholars who were who were active. Um, it was a very it was a wonderful time. It was a small organization then, um, but it was had a lot of really really wonderful people. And I guess what I learned was that the more you can the more you can uh, let other people um, lead, the the better the the organization. Um, that it's it's we have a tendency sometimes those of us who are in these positions to want to do everything, but in fact the, the goal really needs to be to get everybody else involved, um, so that they feel that they're they have a stake in the in the organization and they're getting something out of it and they're developing leadership skills as well. I guess that's what I would say. Very nicely said. I think I second that when I was um, engaged with Watiso, there's just an amazing amount of people, knowledge base, experience, um, and, and you learn and you network and you build relationships and it's, it's invaluable. Um, and again, having folks that you work with um, that are smarter than you, which is what I like to do. Um, <laughs> and that I can rely on to be smarter than me most of the time. Um, so, so I was, I had a uh, great fortune of working with great people on the board and the organization and just meeting more and more people that I still am in contact with today and connections in different ways. The world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So I think I would second what, Jody said as part of the talent pool basically that we have. I'd like to sort of extend that a little bit. Um, you know, it is a volunteer organization and, and as Jody said, you, you want to, you know, get as much, um, as many people involved so they then, you know, have a, have a stake, they have skin in the game as it were. At the same time, I um, realized that it's also important, um, and this is gonna sound, I'm, I hope I'm not gonna make this sound like there's a, a, a cabal, but I think for, to ensure that the, you have continued effective leadership, you have to actively cultivate effective leadership. In other words, if you just throw something out there and say, hey, anybody wanna volunteer, which is all well and good in certain circumstances, um, you're gonna you're gonna wind up with who you wind up with, and so w with that in mind, when I became chair of the nominating committee, you know, I I I made a real concerted effort to to you know recruit people to 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 be nominated for a leadership position who I thought you know had very specific skills and strengths. Uh, for those positions, as opposed to just leaving it up to, eh, you know, whoever has too much time on their hands. And along those lines, um, something that I learned, and this may sound odd, is that people um, are primarily social creatures, and that extends to volunteers. And I guess I came in thinking so much about the mission of Watisol and what was going on in the field, you know, that I didn't stop and consider that we're also interested in people in the field as humans. Um, and that was really reinforced when I went to the International TESOL Convention in Atlanta, and I sat in on these great affiliate meetings and learned about how they were using social media. And they were using social media to kind of do spotlights on members, you know, getting to know them a little better. And it had never occurred to me that you know, there was that kind of human interest factor and sort of along the same lines, we tried a different approach with what he saw that worked um, really well. We, people's schedules were all over the place on weeknights and weekends. 
so we did Friday evening um, board meetings, um, you know, roughly every other month. And we had pizza with them and we encouraged people to bring snacks. And sometimes people would email me and say, well, I was going to join online, but I'll come for the pizza. <laughs> so that kind of camaraderie was really nice. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we can't do that now with all the COVID restrictions, but it really was a good lesson for me that volunteers are just like anyone else and they have a need for social interaction as opposed to just intellectual interaction. It's a little off topic, but it's kind of interesting you make me think now is that when I was president, we were still mailing out all the announcements of any events and we continued that for many years later. Uh, listservs were still a novelty um, and you could get really in really big trouble on a listserv if you weren't very careful about who it was going out to. Um, so the technology over the time that we've been around has really made a big difference. I'd like to add something that, that um, about what Carolyn said about the importance of food um, during, <laughs> oh, this is nice. <laughs> wow. Sorry. No, that's great. When, 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 we, when we had a, um, a really um, wonderful speaker for Watisal, um, and we always did provide food, um, and it was held at Georgetown. And I remember that um, we expected, I guess, maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50 people anyway. It was packed, and we had sandwiches. And Susan Bailey and I went in the back room and cut all the sandwiches in half. So everybody would at least get a half a sandwich. But we learned from that, you always want to have more food than you need, not less. <laughs> That's a good lesson. I have to add the story that I have, which please, is, please. Uh, you also have to make people happy, which was, I, I think I took the, the idea of the conference a little bit, maybe like Betsy's been describing. I was like, this is a conference, we're here to think. Uh, I'm not going to have a theme. We're not going to have table decorations because I'm anti. And, you know, we'll have a, a clear but succinct menu. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we had these, you know, no table decorations. And I think we had Waldorf salad for lunch. And um, so end of the day, it went pretty well. But end of the day, we get all these, these evaluations. And I'll just, I still have it in my head. Somebody wrote, Grapes and chicken do not a lunch make. This was funny how people had such oh. strong opinions about the food and we had to go back to lasagna. Like, <laughs> okay, anyway, I, lots of stories like that, but um, food is important. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other things that you learned about yourself or the organization? I'll just, I'll just add that for me, again, I'm sort of going back to my, my passion for what organizations are and, you know, what makes one live and when it has its weak moments, why should it continue? And um, I think what we do is so important for the profession. And I, I felt that personally by meeting Shirley and we met at one of the, the first conferences at American U there in 1999, and it led to all kinds of collaboration. And um, without an organization to bring people together, I, I can't imagine, and it's impossible to know all of the things we would have missed out on as a profession. You know, who wouldn't have met, who wouldn't have collaborated. And I think, I think it's important to keep that in mind whenever we're in those, the low times of an organization and, and right through the high times too. I think one of the things that makes uh, Watiso so important, or uh, affiliates in general, is it gives us an opportunity to learn from people who are not doing the exact same thing that we are. Mm -hmm. We get professional mm -hmm. development. If we're, if we're teaching at a university, we get professional development and how to do that. And if you're teaching in K-12, to you get professional. But what happens, I think, when you bring people together is you learn from each other, you learn the things that you have in common, but you also learn wonderful ideas of things that you never thought of, that you, that you actually now can, can implement um, or can try. Um, it, it just expands the pool of knowledge and the ideas, as well as obviously the, the, the personal connections with people that you might not otherwise get a chance to, to get to know or to be with. I think 
it's both personal and professional. That's, that's a very nice segue into thinking about, um, there's, there's many, many audience members and, and Watisil members on the call with us today. What would you say to them and their colleagues to, if they're thinking about being more involved in Watisil or serving in the leadership role, um, what would you say to inspire Watisil professionals to encourage them? to get more involved. One thing that I'd say is, um, and this relates to something that someone had mentioned earlier, is to identify a very specific way that you can contribute. Um, it might be um, serving as a volunteer at the conference. It might be um, serving as a liaison to a professional development event at your particular institution. It might be occupying a specific position on the board. But I think once you can identify sort of what your niche is, you know, even if it's contributing an article to the newsletter, that's great you know, go for it. It doesn't have to be this huge idea of Watisol, you join and you're expected to sort of participate in everything. Um, what I le really learned about volunteers is that they give what they can and you have to really appreciate what that niche is. Um, maybe somebody can help put out a newsletter twice a year. Maybe somebody can help to um, coordinate all the membership, you know, which requires checking in several times a week, but you need both types of volunteers. You also need those people who help out with smaller scale events. Um, and I think that's um, a way to encourage people is to start out with those smaller events and say, hey, can you come 30 minutes early to the next PD event and help set up coffee and food? Well, I have argued for a long, long time that when it comes to teachers, when it comes to them continuing to develop professionally, but also to fight off burnout, which seems to be a little bit stronger in our profession than many, the way you do that is to get involved with uh, communities of practice. And they may be formal or they may be informal, but I really think very, very <laughs> impressionistically, but I really think we do most of our learning talking together rather than going through some explicit training channel. I think that has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to open up to people how egalitarian we are. I remember being just shocked the first time I was working with David Noonan and he said, just call me David. It's like I... <laughs> um, and in the same way, I think about George Brain and how George Brain brings over backward to take new graduate students and bring them in and say, here, do this. You can publish. You can't publish this, but you can publish this and you can do it here. So I think in many ways, first of all, belonging to uh, an association allows you to take whatever you're learning in your teacher education class and see how it exists in the real world and see how people react when it's not somebody standing up in front of the class and everybody taking notes. And I think too, it's, and the result of that is that the whole association or the whole association gets professionalized. That's how you become a professional is participating with others, not just in the class, but outside. Mm -hmm. I think also that teaching is a pretty isolating profession yeah. um, and that we really need opportunities to, to to be able to reach out and to have to have this community of practice or to have this sense of, of collegiality, um, because it, I, I just it doesn't matter whether you're teaching at a secondary school or your primary school, adult school. I mean, basically, it's you and your and your students, and occasionally there's a meeting um, that you know somebody calls, um, and it just it's really critically important, I think, to have, to, to, to be able to have these networks and to, to find people who um, you can communicate with. And, and I mean, you develop friendships with um, as, as you're working in these fields. Uh, 
but otherwise, and right now, I, I think it's really critical, important now, and we don't, we can't even, oh, how do we get together? We get together online, virtually, it's uh, not the same. I mean, at least it isn't for me, but I'm also old. <laughs> it may not be quite as much of a problem for younger folks, but I'm, I really miss being with people. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, same. Let's to open up for, I'm looking at the clock and I want to give uh, the audience an opportunity to ask any questions that are on your mind. Um, I have a few more to close us up with, but before, if anybody has questions, you can feel free to unmute, unmute or um, pop them into the chat box. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show some photos as we <laughs> take a pause here. This is from the 15 year anniversary. No. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody know who some of these folks are? Well, it, when Nina Liakos on the, the yeah. left hand side. Okay. Yeah. Is, it, is it Christine in the back? I think it is. Christy Maloney? I think. Oh, right. Yes. Um, it's you know they all look a lot different than they look now. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, oh, from Maryland English Institute, the one sitting next to um, uh, Niakos. Oh, what's her name? I, I think I should know, <laughs> but anybody have those names? I have a lot of photos in the archives and none of them are labeled, but oh, yeah. I, I can text you a little bit of sleuthing because many of these photos also appear in the newsletters. So I can go to the newsletters and find the names from there. So I'll have to go do that work. So here's Wati Sol and uh, let's see, so this would be 85. Here is some photos from 1990. Yeah, I know all of those people. <laughs> There's Susan and Jim and Penny Alatus and George yeah. Thanos and George Bazzini and uh, Grace Burkhart. They're, yeah, <laughs> uh, Shirley Thompson. Um, not, not Shirley Thompson. Um, oh, Shirley. It'll come. And is Carol, probably, yeah, Carol Kreidler's uh, next to her. Um, it'll take me a few minutes, but I think I know all of those. <laughs> And here we have the 25th anniversary. <laughs> On top of the world, that's good. Yeah. I think Shirley Thompson designed that logo. Is that oh, right? Really? Nice. That's very possible. <laughs> yeah, I remember, because I met her shortly after that uh, when, yeah, that's... <laughs> Does anybody recognize the folks that with their with their glasses, <laughs> with their wine glasses? I guess. <laughs> Is that Susan Bailey on the left? I don't know. Looks like it might be. Uh, you have to go back to the newsletters and find the captions. Yeah. And then there's a, there's a gap in the photos. I don't have any after that. Uh, and of course I have a lot more, but those were the, those were the highlights. Um, but uh, Jody, you mentioned George. Am I pronouncing his last name right, Bozzini? Yes. Uh -huh. So he was a former Watiso president and on the 10th anniversary, he said, Watiso is alive and a well. <laughs> Perennial and perennially enriched not only by demographical good fortune, but by the strength of its tradition and by the dedication and forward looking thinking of both its leadership and its membership. And what struck me about that quote was that I believe it still applies today. Mm -hmm. And we could say the same thing here we are at 50 years. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a very proud moment for us all as um, you know, former board members to know that we've carried the organization forward.
So are there any questions from the, from the group or anything from the panelists that I didn't ask that you want to share? I have a story I want to tell. Oh, please. Jody, when were you president? 81 to 83. Okay. So, okay, yeah, that would make sense. So, I knew about Joni, Jody back in those days because, <laughs> I, because I had used her American Ways book. It was probably mm -hmm. one of the few experts that I knew of other than somebody obviously like uh, David. And so I knew who she was. And then after that, I got my graduate degree and I spent some time in France and I spent some time in uh, West Africa and I spent some time in uh, Korea and then I went off and did some more time in Africa. And finally, I was coming back to the United States to take a job at American University. And I noticed that Jody was in the area. And I was thinking to myself, me, I'd never published anything. I'd never been very active in any associations. I thought, wow, wouldn't that be cool if you're going to be an English teacher to be the president of the TESOL Association? And I immediately dismissed it because I couldn't imagine, that'd be like imagining you're going to be president of the United States, it seemed to me. <laughs> and then a few years later, somebody called me up and said, do you want to be president of YT? So I just kept going from there. But it was like, it was like a childhood dream, except I wasn't a child anymore. And nor was it a dream. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah, it does seem, um, you know, from the outside before you become a board member sometimes, it seems like an extraordinary role. And it, it is a lot of responsibility. Um, and I, I would encourage others to consider doing it. It's an extraordinarily wonderful learning experience for yourself, for professional growth and a way to give back to an organization that has meant so much to so many. There, we have one question here. Um, knowing that many of our members lack mentors, what can we an, as an organization do? What do you wish a mentor had said to you or done for you? How can we build good mentors? Such a great question. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether this refers to mentors in terms of the, the, the actual teaching or mentors in terms of becoming involved in Watisol. Um, I mean, there are models, certainly one of the things that TESOL does, which I think is wonderful, is they have these um, masters and doctoral uh, forums where they, where they match it. I did this one time, I matched doctoral students with somebody in the profession who was going to come to TESOL that they could actually spend some time together. It would be a lot easier to do that here because we have people in, in that are all close by. Um, but it would, it, I, we need to know what it is that it, what it is that they like mentorship in. And I, I think that she, that Allison, LA's, I, I'm not sure I know how to pronounce the name LA's, um, that a lot of people do like mentors, certainly in their field, professionally in, in teaching. Um, maybe I was lucky to have mentors by my, my, my very blessed. <laughs> um, so I don't, it's a little hard to know. Um, I was just speaking generally, because I think the question that was asked earlier in the opening session wasn't super specific. So, uh, mentors in leadership, mentors in, um, um, and just professional development and then of course just key areas that people are interested in i think people are people sometimes are saying well where are the people who are doing exactly what i want to do and how do i get them to take an interest in <laughs> mentoring me yeah I, I do think the model that tesol uses would easily be adapted here which is to identify people who want this relationship to find out what the areas are that they're interested in and then match them with people who are who are coming to the, the, the conference or perhaps not even necessarily to the conference if we ever could be there and per certainly you could do it now online but it would be nice to be able to somehow meet each other um, but it takes somebody to, to organize that it's a, there's a lot of organization that, that in order to do that to reach out and then to figure out who, who would be a good match perhaps by asking people who want to be mentors and people who want mentoring and seeing if we can match them 
Oh, I see Betsy shaking her head. I think that she's going challenge accepted. <laughs> I, mean, I was just thinking that this would be great yeah. for what he saw to take on as a project, a mentoring mm -hmm. project. Um, yeah. You know, I had, I was fortunate to have really good mentors, but not everybody has access to that. So I think that maybe that's something that what he saw could help facilitate maybe through the special interest groups. Yeah, we can take that back to the, the incoming board as a, as a question for them to, to think about. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much, Alessia. All right, I think we have come to the end of our time and I want to say uh, with great gratitude, thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Thank you for serving the organization over the years that you did. Um, and it's just lovely to see you all. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Thanks for putting yeah. Thanks, Heather. bringing us together. Hey, thanks for organizing this. It was yeah. great. Yeah, very fun to celebrate our 50th, right? Here we go. Happy birthday, Watisol! Yay! <laughs>